One of my favorite choruses says, Change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. As we're gathering for worship today, I wonder if you could make changes in your life, in body or in mind or in spirit, what changes would you make? And if God could make changes in your life, what changes do you think that God would make? As we worship this week, we're continuing our journey through the Wesley Challenge. In the same way that last week we had an upward focus talking about our relationship with God in Jesus Christ. This week we have an inward focus and we're talking about our relationship to ourselves. Chris Folmsley writes, Wesley knew that in order to fully live into our God-intended design, we must be authentic people whose inner lives match our outer lives. Wesley gave us seven questions that lead us toward determining our true self. In order to be real and true to our emerging faith, Christians must do the hard work of becoming honest with themselves. Some of the questions may actually surprise you because they have not only to do with our spiritual life and our emotional and mental life, they also have to do with how well we take care of ourselves in body. And so these are the questions that we're going to be embracing on our day-by-day -day journey in the coming week. Am I proud? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? Do I grumble or complain constantly? Am I a slave to dress, friends, work, or habits? How do I spend my spare time? And finally, am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? The most important thing for us to do as we are embracing these questions is to remember that God already knows the truth. The question is, how truthful are we willing to be with ourselves? God already loves us just the way we are. There's nothing that we can do to make God love us more or less than God loves us right now. But God loves us too much to leave us just the way we are. If we submit ourselves to God, if we come fully before God, God will remold and remake us as God intends. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in our worship today. As we do, I hope that you will light a candle wherever you may be to remember that you are surrounded by the light of Christ. Take a moment in the comments and description attached to this video to find the link where you can register your prayer, your attendance, and share a prayer concern with us if you would like. Finally, there's a place there where you can make a donation either by text, online, or through the mail to help further the work that God is doing in and through Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. As we're preparing for worship, will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. Holy God, we gather to sing your praise and to hear your word. Speak to us now that we may be wise enough to perceive your call. Strengthen us now that we may be brave enough to answer when you call. Guide us now that we may follow where you would have us go. Amen. And now let us rejoice as our handbells lead us in just a closer walk with thee.
when I was a little girl, the best thing about having chicken for dinner was the wishbone. This is the wishbone from a chicken. There's only one of these bones in chickens, and I don't know where this tradition came from, but by the time I was a little girl, everybody knew that two people would take the wishbone after dinner, each hold the side of it, and pull it apart. And when you pull it apart, it breaks into two pieces, but this top part stays with either one piece or the other. And so they would hold on to the wishbone, make a wish that they kept secret in their heads, pull it apart, and then whoever got the long piece cheered and yelled and the other one said something like, that wasn't fair. Have you ever wished for something? Well, of course you have. All of us have wished for things and we always hoped that they would really happen. Well, let's think about that. Have you ever been on a picnic and it started raining and you said, I wish that rain would stop. What would happen if that really did happen and it stopped raining forever, never ever rained again? There'd be no grass. Pretty soon there would be no flowers or trees. Rivers and lakes and streams would all dry up. So there'd be no water to water the fields or even to drink. The world would be a miserable place, wouldn't it? If it really stopped raining. James and John were two brothers who were disciples of Jesus. And one day the two of them came to Jesus and said to him, we want you to do everything we ask you to do forever. Jesus answered them and said, well, what is it you want me to do? And they said, in your glorious kingdom, we want to sit in the very best places and be honored. One of us on your right side and one on your left side. They thought that Jesus was going to create a kingdom on earth and that he was going to be the king on earth. And they knew about kings of countries and they knew that there was a order of who was the most important. And so they wanted to share in his greatness by getting to sit beside him on his throne. Jesus answered them and said, you don't know what you're asking for. And then he explained to them that in God's eyes, whoever wants to be a servant of everyone else, if they want to follow and be important to God. Jesus said, even I, the son of God, was not sent to earth so that people could serve me. I was sent by God to show people that what God wants is they quit thinking about themselves so much and they think about how they can help others. I don't think that being a servant like that was exactly what James and John were wishing for, do you? The Bible tells us to strive to be more like Jesus. When we're in church, we think about that. We might even say, I wish I could be like Jesus. If we really want that wish to come true, then we have to give up thinking about all the things we want and that we want people to give to us and do for us. And instead, we put our thoughts on how we can help others. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he tried to teach us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us to want to be more like you, and then help us to be like you. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Mark 10, 35 through 45. Listen for the word of God. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. 
And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they came to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that amongst the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as the rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to become first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scripture. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
In our worship this week, we are continuing to consider the 21 questions that John Wesley prepared in 1729 to help the First Methodist, a group of college students, including his own brother Charles at Oxford University, to grow in their spiritual life. Last week, we had an upward focus, addressing seven questions that looked at our relationship with God. And this week, we focus inward at our relationship with ourselves. They invite us to consider the kind of character that we're cultivating in our own lives. And I wonder, as we're doing so, do you remember those episodes of old movies and television shows that centered around an evil twin brother? From the time that Michael Landon played little Joe Cartwright and an escaped prisoner in an early episode of Bonanza, the concept of an evil twin has been stock and trade in situation comedies and television dramas. From Samantha, the good witch, and Serena, her mischievous cousin, to the identical cousins portrayed by Patty Duke in her own television show, the relative mayhem of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde has provided us with both mischief and amusement. That reality, when it is reflected in our own lives, is as clear as a conversation that Carla might have with a parishioner who remarks, your husband is so compassionate and kind. If she responded truthfully, Carla might simply say, yes, he can be, because I can. But the truth is that there's also a darker side of my personality, a downside that I'm not always proud of, if ever. And before you become too critical or consoling, let me remind you that the same can probably be said of you. A few years ago, David Brooks wrote an excellent book called The Road to Character. He begins by reflecting on the two creation stories contained in Genesis and the two depictions of Adam that we get from them. Genesis chapter 1 is liturgical poetry. In it, God speaks Adam and Eve into existence and then pronounces that they are good. Only in Genesis 1 does the text say that we were created in God's image. A different story emerges when we see Adam as reflected in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. There God creates human beings of the dust of the earth. He creates the man first and then the woman. He tells them not to eat of the forbidden fruit, but of course they do anyway, believing that by eating this fruit they can be like God, and in the process, paradise is lost. Brooks speaks of these two depictions of Adam, and yet they both live within us. Brooks describes the Adam of Genesis 1 as wanting to do good and to be good, to serve the world and to care for it. He would be characterized by humility and spirituality, by morality and inheritant goodness. The Adam that we see depicted in Genesis 2 and 3, on the other hand, is interested in status, in doing what he needs to do regardless of the consequences. In fact, he's an expert on rationalizing and blaming when he is caught by God doing the very thing that God has set a boundary around, he says, you know, God, it's really your fault. If you hadn't given me her, then we wouldn't be in this mess. Noting that these two Adams live in both of us, Brooks writes, we live in a culture that teaches us to promote and advertise ourselves and to master the skills required for success. But that gives little encouragement to humility, to sympathy, and honest self-confrontation, which are necessary for building character. Of course, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we want to be more like him and to reflect the image of God's goodness and grace that we were created to embody. But even followers of Jesus struggle with what it means to be fully human. I mean, just consider the dilemma that is presented in today's scripture. James and John had been following Jesus for three years. The disciples were on their way with Jesus to Jerusalem, and despite his efforts to prepare them for the fact that he would be put to death there, the disciples still believed that he would be crowned king and would rule over Israel. That's why James and John come to Jesus secretly, apart from the others, looking for the posh seats in his cabinet. Listen, James and John say, Teacher, we want you to do for us what we ask. What is it that you want? Jesus inquires. And they say, 
allow one of us to sit at your right and one of us to sit at your left, one to be your vice president and the other to be your secretary of state. Which of the two stories of Adam do you think they're reflecting there? Nothing would have made them happier than having people look up at Jesus and his dream team, marveling at how great they are. But there are a couple of problems with being great. The first is a life of illusion, and the second is a state of confusion. First, the life of illusion. It's an illusion that you are more invincible and powerful and righteous than you really are. History is full of men and women who are described as the great, although they all had their weaknesses and blind spots. From Alexander the Great, who was undefeated in battle as he conquered all of the known world, only to die later of malaria from the sting of a simple mosquito. To Ramses the Great, whose unrighteousness enslaved the Israelites and caused Moses to say, let my people go, as he led the exodus out of Egypt. History teaches us that what the world calls greatness is often linked to a life of illusion, one which causes people to believe that they are more invincible, powerful, and righteous than they really are. In light of that, Wesley calls us to embrace the totality of who we are as we address questions like the ones we will encounter this week. Am I proud? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? Do I grumble and complain constantly? Am I a slave to dress, to friends, to work or habits? How do I spend my spare time? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? As we answer these questions, we are focusing on the totality of our lives, in body as well as in mind and spirit and they encourage true humility, calling us to see ourselves as we really are, exaggerating neither our successes nor our failures. Again, let us remember that God already knows the truth about our lives. The question is whether or not in judging ourselves, we will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. A few of us, of course, will be quite content to exaggerate our sense of success and self-importance. Others may feign humility, putting ourselves down so that others will redeem us by lifting us up. We're probably inclined to do so because of the second challenge, and that is the confusion about what real greatness actually is. Addressing James and John, and by extension, you and me, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? You see, Jesus senses that they are confused about what they're getting themselves into, and he makes it abundantly clear that the path to glory goes straight through the wilderness and towards suffering. Of course, the brothers reply, as we are inclined to do, Lord, we are able. But in spite of their outward confidence, we have to expect that they don't know what they are really talking about. Jesus doesn't, however, denounce them. He simply promises that it will be so. And indeed, in the end, both of them suffered. One was martyred. But as for positions of honor, Jesus says, to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant. Jesus can promise suffering, death, and new life to all who follow him in faith, but the granting of special places in the kingdom of heaven? That is God's call and God's alone, because God is in control. Jesus points out to the brothers, as well as to the other disciples who, by the way, are offended at their bravado, that whoever wishes to become great among you must be the servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be the servant of all. Clearly, the key to being the greatest of disciples is to be a servant of others, and Jesus doesn't stop by giving lip service to this prophecy. He puts into practice what he preaches. Remember that even on the night in which he gathered with his friends for what would be the last time in his earthly life, Jesus wrapped himself in a towel and washed their dusty, dirty feet. Even the Son of Man, he said, 
came not to be served, but to serve. Friends, my hope is that from that vantage point, we will reflect inwardly on the questions that we are going to be embracing in the coming week. And then, and perhaps only then, will we be clearly able to shift our focus outward as we consider what it means to be followers of Jesus, to walk in his footsteps by working on our relationship with the neighbors that he gave us to serve in the world that he died to save. As we do so, let us close today by praying again the covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven.